Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where and when you're watching this broadcast. I'm Thomas Fester, my friends, and this is Disclosure Tonight. Happy Saturday, everybody. It's that day of the week that we turn our clocks back to go ahead and start our production time. Well, a little bit late like we usually. It's fashionably late for that matter, but we're turning back our clocks from... 6 p.m. Pacific to 10 p.m. GMT to open up the show, the live show for many of our friends in the UK and, of course, Europe. I want to welcome all of our guests in who are here from me uh, that we are aware of. We have friends in the Netherlands, United Kingdom. I believe we have some uh, several friends in Sweden. If you're also out there joining us from somewhere else in the UK, let us know in the chat. We'd love to know how far our reach goes on that matter. I want to go ahead and figure out what I did with the chat and welcome in our chat. Let me go ahead and do this. Here we go. Yeah, participants. Oh, well, ah, that works. Wrong chat, but it works. <laughs> Let's go ahead and see who the heck we have out there on that note. Let me go ahead and strike up the drums. All right, folks, let's go ahead and welcome you all in. Who in the heck do we have out there? Let's take a look and see. We have Mr. Anthony Mack after death. Avi M's here all the way from India. Welcome, my friend. Charles Kerr, Fox Moldering. Jan is here along with Jay Catch on Napper, Kathy, and Kelly Barot with her piercing blue eyes. They really are. They really are. Matt Ramon's here from the great state of Ohio. Metal Gaming, I forgot, is from Denmark. Neil Carr is here. Paul DeMon. Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs from the great state of Florida. Rough Ready's here. Scott Jensen. Shelly. Shelly Montgomery. She's here, and she's in our chat. Thanks for being part of our uh, broadcast today, Shelly. Who else do we have out there? We've got Sven from Sweden. Tia Loreno. TK. And yell Tommy Tanker, also known as Andy. What a great chat. I am so humbled and thankful, seriously, for everyone being out there today. And I need to shut. I've got the wrong chat window up, but you know what? I was trying to get some stuff set up ahead of time. And let me leave this music going for a second where I can find my real chat Chrome. Meet live streaming YouTube. That's not it. I guess I can bring it back this way. Say restore chat and then pop out the chat. All right, there it is. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I can see y'all. Hey, look at that. We got Anonymous Rex coming in from the great state of Oregon. Speaking about Oregon, where in the heck is Neil Carr? Hopefully you're doing all right. Man, we've had some torrential rains here today. Unbelievable. It's been it's been <laughs> so uh, it's been happening in New York as well. Let me go ahead and fix OBS. I keep on looking off into the middle of nowhere land right into my light to go ahead and bring out a win oh, don't don't want to do that. Window projector preview. There we go. Up oh, there I am. Let's take it up. All right. Yeah, we've got an interesting broadcast today. Yeah, we're going to be talking about UAP reporting and scientific assessment in the UK. But before I and the EU for that matter, not the UK, my fault. Let, on that note, let's go ahead and let's go ahead. Would you look at that? Woohoo! Scott Jensen, nine ninety nine, nine pounds ninety nine pence. Super chat coming in from Mister Scott Jensen. Now I could figure out where in the hell that I put my other chat at. Oh, there it is. Nope, that's the top chat. Where'd it go? Dang it. It's one of those days. I tell you, I am running behind. I'm running ahead, and let's find this one that it says social stream dashboard. Ah, there it is over there. Let me go ahead and bring it up. Let's thank Scott Jensen for that wonderful super chat. Woohoo! Let me kick off the drums and pull out the thanks music. Yes. Thank you, Scott Jensen, for starting off tonight's super chats. Scott says CE5 for. All way to go. Woohoo! Sounds like he's been having some fun times with meditation, trying to reach our friends up in the sky. Yeah, they're around. <laughs> they're not just in the sky. They are around us, my friends. And uh, interesting. I want to thank Scott Jensen for your wonderful super chat. Remember, every dollar that comes in disclosure tonight, yeah, it goes back into our production fund. I am personally so humbled and thankful for you, Scott, for going ahead and starting off tonight's super chats. On that matter, I want to go ahead. Oh, wow, no notifications. From Anonymous Rex, that is odd. Yes, we'll have to figure that one out, but let's get to it on that note. Let's go ahead and turn off this music, and it's time to go ahead and welcome in our back panel. Remember, anyone who wants to join, go ahead and follow that link at the top of the chat, and you can come and join our back audience, ask questions, raise your hands, or just say hello. Let's go ahead and welcome in. Who do we have there? I think he's back. Let's go ahead and welcome our dear friend from the UK, Mr. Yellow Tommy Tanker, also known as Andy. How's it going, Andy? Hey, Thomas. Yes, I am back. Yes, still waiting for the clots to change, so it's, it's an early one for me again tonight. 
Yeah, so uh, yeah. you like us, the the clocks are going to skip ahead an hour, which yep. means instead of being 4 a.m., it's 3 a.m. But actually, if you've got little kids who get up in the morning, it actually works better because you're actually getting some more sleep. But if you're an average working man like myself, <laughs> oh, that uh, – yeah. It's a pain in the ass. Why can't we just take one oh. time and stop the changes? It seems pretty. I absurd. know it's it's kind of outdated. Yes, yeah, it is, my we're... friend. Absolutely, and I did miss you doing the thing earlier. But thank you for coming <laughs> in, my friend. I'll... I will. I will very quickly for everybody. Yeah, I was asked to do my my cousin it. So cousin it. There we go. Two, two seconds. There we go. Look, there we are. <laughs> it's brighten everybody's day up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I knew we'd get an alien here one way or the other. Also, want to thank you very much, Andy. Want to th- I want to welcome our dear friend who's usually working, but he's not working today, Mr. Matt Ramon, coming to us from the great state of Ohio. How you doing today, Matt? Yeah, I'm off. I'm loving it. It's a full show today, my friend. Full show. It's a full show today. I'm trying to look at the fuck. What the hell happened to my chat? There is something off to the, is it over here? Oh, it's that. I got to go. Okay, let me go ahead and fix this. This is me just being, all right, let me get into desktop video. Where is it at? The angle screen that I have, guest angle. All right, there we go. Let me go ahead and correct this and just crop the side of the picture a little bit more. All right, there we go. Now, if I come back into here, studio, zoom. Perfect, the line, almost, dang it. Matt, 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 you are making it so difficult for me right now. Let's try and do this one more time, a little bit more. That's good enough. Well, eh, let's just, I'll, I'll take it and work with it. Let's get back into desktop Zoom again. All right. Thank you very much for coming in today, Matt. Yeah, what a great day to have uh, to talk about disclosure. And I can see what I just screwed up on that one. I did it too much. Dang it. I know you're seeing me uh, being, oh, not that one. Guest yes, Stangle. <laughs> if you guys are on twitter last night today i did a good tweet out there my god yeah let's go ahead and bring this back <laughs> desktop super chat all right there we go perfect matt wonderful to have you here also in the back we've got our friend coming from the from the country where all the users are silent mr michael suckloff how's it going michael doing good thomas can't wait to get this show on the road Oh, you're telling you're telling me you're telling me on that note. Let's go ahead and welcome in our dear friend from uh, the state. I used to call Borgen, but clearly it's not boring because Neil's car is here. How how you doing, Neil? I am good, Thomas. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm here. All right, my friend. Also out there, we've got our dear friend Rachel Smith. How's it going, Rachel? Oh, good, Thomas. Hoping for a good show today. Oh, I'm hoping so, too. Also in the back, we've got our other dear friend coming to us from the great state of New York, Mrs. Tia Loreno. How's it going, Tia? Hey, Thomas. Good show. Good show for for today. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. And then that wraps us back to, well, you know, Mike, 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 disclosure. How's it going, Mike? He's not in the chat at the moment. Oh, sorry, Mike's not here right now. <laughs> All right, let's go. It's ahead. going great. Great, Thomas. Uh, yeah, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I had to do your voice last night. <laughs> it's going well, Thomas. I call on oh, you. Oh, hey, Nick showed up. Hi, Thomas. I, I know, but well, <laughs> he did. But I actually, when I called on you last night, Neil, you weren't there. You didn't answer. So and I just waited oh. and waited and waited. And I was like, oh, I'm doing fine, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. I thought my mic was working, but apparently not. You were muted. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't have my headphones, and uh, so I guess my uh, microphone's not working on my laptop, so I'll have to look into that. Oh, we'll figure it out, my friend. Uh, either way, it's wonderful having you here. Great to see you awesome. outside in your car. Having a, You having a cigarette there? I am, I am. There so, I, don't don't smoke, kids. Bad yeah. for you. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. I should not. We saw it. We didn't. Don't just puff it on the screen. We're absolutely fine. We'll keep this kid friendly. Uh, on that note, let's go ahead. Yes, yes, Nick yes. Let me back in. What, Michael? Nick just popped in. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Great. Great, Thomas. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nick, you can say hello. Yes, don't worry pretty about good, it. Thomas. Great. Hey, Nick. Good. 
you actually said thank you if we if we waited long enough appreciate you coming in today my friend and i appreciate the questions you always bring forward going ahead and talking about abductions and all all the kind of things and asking i kind of like like a, I, I, I like because i was kind of like amazed that i like I like he didn't even have an answer to like uh, uh, like what if there was agreements? Uh, like he couldn't even answer that because like he, like he never thought about that before actually because I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. But sometimes you just have to take people down that journey where you're thinking to help them get to it. And I think we actually had a pretty good conversation about it because you know when we had on our guest on last night's show, um, Tim Ventura, Nick brought up a question about abductions and what if our United States government, more importantly, has a deal with the non-human intelligence you never get technology for free there's always a cost does that mean our government is covering its, its eyes and its ears to a known threat against the citizens of our country just so they can go ahead and get their hands on the technology there's a good chance that could be going on and i'm glad i'm glad you brought up that question last night nick uh tia Yeah, I wanted to say this too, Nick. I think it's a great question. And Thomas, why do they always make it seem like it's such a an outlandish question to ask? Like, I think it, that should be like probably one of the first questions that need to be answered is if they're really doing that. Yeah. You know, and they always seem like it's um, like the, the worst question that can be asked. And it's actually the number one question. I think because I, uh, I don't think that like, humans could handle that. I don't think humans could handle that question. Actually, I just I just don't think they could handle that question. Yeah, that would be that you basically sold out humanity for technology, actually, and that would be horrible for humans. I, I think if I might add into this one with a hiccup along the way, um, the way that a lot of people see this in our government and other places is the only thing they're willing to talk about seriously is the craft they don't want to talk about and they want to focus on what color it is what is uh its flight characteristics they want to uh, you know uh, talk about how where it's you know potentially how it's coming into our space and you know i have to go back to an analogy and i always look at things with analogy because it's ways for a lot of people like our audience and, and people in general to go ahead and look at this let me do this. Be a little rant on this one. Everyone wants to focus on the craft. They don't want to talk about what the hell is in the craft. More importantly, even if they know, they don't want to be talking about what that craft is doing here. That, my friends, is the true problem we have with disclosure going on today. Yes, there are people that have good good evidence of being abducted, just like with sightings and everything else, let's say 95% of all the people who said who had something go on with them, just like with pictures, not that I want to throw them under the bus, let's, take, let's throw out 95% of the reportings and let's focus down on that really good 5% that's out there. And of that 5%, we can at least talk about them. We can at least talk about those instances. We can also try and delve into what are they doing here? Why are they here? Because you know what? If there is a white van that's patrolling the, the, street, the streets of a subdivision in upstate New York. Okay, we've got a white van patrolling. That's it. No. Let's focus on the engine. Let's focus on the color of it. Let's focus on how fast it goes. And that's all we're, yeah, there's a van that's been spotted in these subdivisions of upstate New York. It's moving pretty slow. Looks like it's a Ford, or maybe it's a Chevy or a GMC. We don't know. Could be a Nissan for that matter. We need you to look for it. But here's the thing. Here's the big thing. We don't hear that in our news. There is a, there are, there is a vehicle driving around the subdivisions. Now, this is hypothetical of upstate New York. That is abducting children. They're taking the children away. 
they're doing things to them, horrible things to them. Some of the kids escape and get out, but a lot of them don't. That's what our news media focuses on for human things, for stuff that affects us. But when it comes to UFOs, what Nick was bringing up, what Tia was just talking about, that's the issue. What the hell are these things doing here? What are they doing to us, the average citizens? Sure, they're watching the cops are basically our military. They're seeing where the cops are going to and from, taking back that white van. They're assessing where they can go ahead and be undisturbed to do the shit against us, the humanity that they do. That's the real problem. Talking about the craft, focusing on the craft, the dynamics of the craft, how we can take and use that craft for our military... That's what their focus is. Our government doesn't give a shit what happens to us. Let's be real about it. And I wish it was different, but it's a true fact that so many people look past and say, oh my God, it's a bunch of crazies. But it's not a bunch of crazies. It's a bunch of people who have had shit done to them. They have been taken away against their will. Again, throw away 95% of the reports you get focusing on that 5%. That 5% is enough for us to call is is enough for a call to action. Pull in 10%, pull in 25%. There's a bigger need that's out there. They go ahead and take and say, "Oh my god, sleep you're seeing stuff. Oh, it's just sleep paralysis. You don't know what you're talking about. There were no aliens, nothing there. You were making it up, but I'm sorry. Sleep paralysis doesn't make you see an alien." doesn't make you float out through a wall, doesn't take you up into a craft and have things done to you and give you lifelong scarring memories that'll never go away. It will give you terror points that when you run into something, all of a sudden this unbelievable fear just washes over your body and you're terrified and you're like, as an adult, for things that happen when you're a kid, you're like, holy fuck. Fuck, what the hell happened to me when I was a kid? What is this from? And then you go digging through meditation. You figure out what it was. Maybe not, it's maybe not what you want to see, but a lot of times the truth is that just that. And we need to be able to get past just focusing on the craft and focusing seriously on the people that it's affecting. Is that kind of what you're bringing up, Nick? Tia? Anybody? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. And it's because I want to know, and I want to know what it is I can do to help protect myself. If, I mean, obviously, if they come in, I'm, I'm already done, right? But if I can do something to help prevent it, I think they should be telling people that. Sing a song in your mind. That seems to be the, the trick. <laughs> If you go ahead and have a song going in your mind, from what we've heard, it prevents them from putting you into that zone. Granted, you might have to start singing a song before you know, but as soon as you see, you need just to start getting to find a favorite song that you have, whether it's a a nursery rhyme or something, or current song, just know that is your level of protection, Michael. What's interesting is that uh, of all, you know, of all these reports and stuff, is that the children remember, but adults don't. And I wonder if it has something to do with your brain development as a child in through to adulthood, so that children remember because they can't, for some reason, uh, are able to erase their memories when they're that young, as opposed to uh, an adult where it would be easier to do because they've got a fully developed thinking well, brain. Is, is Janice saying in the chat, adults remember on this? Yes, some, uh, uh, yeah, some, I, do, you know, some don't I understand that, but I, I think there's a higher number. I'm wondering if there's a higher number of children, people that when, when they were children, remember. Yeah. Good point. Mike. Be an interesting stat to look into to yeah. see. 
It is an interesting stat. On that note, great conversation, a little bit of a side. We've got a long video to go through here. But before we get to that, let me see if I can bring up desktop document. I yes, we have a breaking UFO news alert. UFOs alert. This is a little just some humor here on Disclosure tonight. Breaking, Sean Kirkpatrick's new book has cleared Dobser. Where does your opinion come from? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I saw this one last night and I could not get past it. Got to have a fun time sometimes being serious about not being serious. All right, to get into it, yes, remember, if you had, we had a great guest on uh, Francisco Guerrero from Portugal who was on uh, last Saturday's show. He had a phenomenal presentation in front of the e uh, EU Parliament on March 20th. We're going to go ahead and play through this. We're going to try and get through as much as we can today. But uh, we had a guest that was going to be here today. I think we lost Mike Disclosure here somewhere. Yeah, we had a guest who was going to be here today, but uh, couldn't make it. So we'll be bringing him on uh, later. Uh, let's go ahead and get to this video. All right, here we go. Let me start this thing up, and we'll have some fun. Let's keep it on time. So thanks, everyone, for, for coming. I will read some uh, introductory remarks, and then we'll go to the presentations, okay? So, first of all, I would like to thank everyone that is involved uh, in this exchange of views, as well as all the participants, citizens, and institutions that are seeing us online. Uh, I won't take much time because I do feel that the focus should be on the speakers and afterwards on the Q&A session. However, let me take a few minutes to share some political information and some technical details. Politically, this event has four main objectives. First, start the debate inside the European Parliament on unidentified anomalous phenomena, which is a topic that is dear to thousands of Europeans. The feedback that I've been having from several EU citizens and outside the EU borders has been overwhelming. Secondly, to decrease the, decrease the stigma associated with the topic inside important sectors of our society, such as civil aviation, the military, journalism, but also politics. Third, and probably the most important, it's essential that all the debates surrounding UAPs is based in the scientific method and held in close cooperation with public institutions, the academia, civil society, and all the professionals that are willing to open and voluntarily share their experiences. Fourth, and lastly, the path of the European Union in regards of UAPs must be made with transparency data sharing and accountability, so we don't lose our credibility in a topic that is dear to many of our constituencies and citizens. Whatever the findings, we must foster this scientific approach to improve our institutions. Therefore, my work as a member of the European Parliament focus on the creation of a EU harmonized system of monitoring, gathering and analysis of data on UAPs. The EU, institutionally composed of 27 member states, does not have such system and thus thousands of citizens and experienced professionals don't know or feel safe to report events they can't explain. We must improve our scientific methodology and connect the EU institutions to the public and academia, and academia in a transparent and credible way. For the sake of transparency, uh, as a politician, I've made three written questions to the European Commission with just one by now was replied. I've also made two interventions in the European plenary about the subject, and last week I've introduced an individual motion for resolution that requests the European Commission uh, the creation of an harmonized system of collecting data and reporting on UAPs inside the EU by upgrading the regulations, uh, regulation 376 2014 on the reporting, analysis, and follow-up of occurrences in civil aviation. After these political considerations, let me present the panel and share some technical information. First, we'll have Mr. André Jol from UAP Quality Netherlands with a presentation about the topic of UAPs. Unfortunately, Mr. Joaquin Deckers could not be present due to health-related issues. After, we'll pass to Mr. Eduardo Russo, from the UAP Czech and Euroinfonet, who will guide us on the UAP's history in the European Union. Thirdly, we'll listen to Mrs. Beatriz Villajuel from the Nordic Institute of Theoretical Physics of Stockholm University and member of the Sol Foundation to present us her vision on the scientific approach we should have on analyzing UAPs. After, we'll connect online 
to the U.S. with a former Navy pilot and executive director of Americans for Safe Aerospace, Ryan Graves. He will enlighten us about the recent developments in USA on the topic. Finally, but not least, we'll hear an important share and testimony of a civil aviator pilot, Christian Van Eist. So all the presentations will have up to 12 minutes, and in the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers. For the Q&A, you can make your questions in the chat online, uh, or raise your hand if you are present in the room. Please be concise when making your questions and direct them to a specific speaker if possible. For a final comment, let me just share that the presentations, views and replies of each speaker are their solely responsibility and those positions may not be shared by other speakers. So after these clarifications, let's jump into the conversation. So Mr. André, you have the floor and you'll go directly to the slides. Thank you, Thank you very much. little delay, not so bad. And remember, for our friends in the back, if you have questions, things you want to talk about, do us a favor. First of all, I'd like to say Go I'm very honored and privileged to awesome. be here, and I'd like to thank very much Francisco Guerrero for organizing this historic event. We, from the UAP Coalition Netherlands, are an independent NGO, and we represent the interests of professionals within aviation, armed forces. NGO, I believe, stands for non-government organization, just so you know. And police who did have an encounter with UAP anomalous, uh, unidentified anomalous phenomena. We also promote research, awareness raising, cooperation and regulations regarding UAP together with a dedicated team of volunteers. So it's essential to understand the significance of UAP, how they intersect with safety of our airspace, with our security and our collective consciousness. So let me first try to explain what are UAP. In a way, the most straightforward definition is this is anything which is in space, air, on land, or in the sea that cannot be identified. In the past, the term UFO, unidentified flying object, was used, but now with more information becoming available, more sensors being online, we know these phenomena are also observed in other domains like the sea, and therefore the acronym and definition was changed. Over the years, there has been an increase in evidence based on a wide range of instrumental observations, for example, infrared, radar, photographs, videos, but also visual observations. By trained observers, meaning pilots, military personnel, airfield personnel, scientists, etc., and also civilians. Near collisions involving military or commercial aircraft have actually been reported in the past. Many observations have also been done at military airfields with storage facilities for nuclear weapons and at nuclear power plants. We feel this is therefore really a serious topic. In recent years, many trained observers like pilots and people from the military have actually come forward uh, with their experiences and their observations. Now, what are we actually talking about? I've taken a slide from the organization JAPAN, which is the French official governmental organization which collects data on UAP, uh, analyzes these and reports on these. It's actually the only officially recognized uh, organization as such in Europe. But of course, there are also many civilian organizations doing similar things. Um, the main message here is actually that, first of all, most of the observation can be explained by, for example, aircraft, drones, satellites, planets, meteors, etc. However, as you will see in... And this is normal. We say the same stuff in the United States, like we're talking about people who said they were abducted. You have to look at the, the overall scope of all the sightings that are out there. Majority of this, we've known this for a long time, are things that are prosaic. But let's not focus on the things that are prosaic. Prosaic means it's a balloon, it's a seagull, it's a weather phenomenon that's going on. Forget about those things. It's that 5 to 10% or 15% of the sightings that are real. That's 
the focus of the conversation. With Sean Kirkpatrick coming out and saying, oh, it's all not real. We're going to focus on this one, this one, this one. We proved them all wrong, but they're leaving out the ones that are the gems that are real. Let me continue. Category D, there is a percentage of about 3%, and this is also the case in many other databases, which cannot be explained. And this is the interesting part of UAP. As said before, um, Eduardo Russo will talk much more about the history of UAP in Europe and outside of Europe. Now, the question, of course, is why should we care about UAP? Why are they important? And the other question is, are they really real? Well, you could argue if UAP are not real, that means that over the past 80 years, trained observers have been seeing things which are a fantasy. This does not appear to make sense as we very much rely on these same professionals to be good observers in their professional capacities. Now, secondly, I think it's interesting to hear what key leaders and key people, for example, in the US are actually saying about the topic of UAP. So I want to show you a short presentation where various people are now, I believe the presentation we have here is in the National Cathedral. It was on uh, December or January after Alvaro Haynes had taken the position of the uh, director of Nas uh, the ODNI, the Office of Director of National Intelligence. Let's go ahead and play. The Let's continue on here. Speaking out. <laughs> what we're if saying there would was be sound. Oh, no sound. <laughs> Can there be sound also? That would be nice. Where? Okay, just for the record, anyone who's watched our show for the longest time have known in the past, well, a long time ago, I used to crash midstream. Yeah. And we had sound issues here and there. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> it happens. Apparently, they didn't bring in the kids from the AV club to set this up ahead of time because everyone thinks they know what they're doing. Let's continue. I'm sorry. And yes, with headaches, too, I've dealt with it. Well, we're going to skip off Avril Haynes and the National Cathedral, and we're just going to go up to talk about the five observables, but I think there's actually six now. Let's continue. Let's see if they get this. Uh-oh. Oh, there they go. They got the window sound back up. Let's go back to Avril Haynes. Oh, they're in PowerPoint. We can tell. Oh, this works. The Val has been... I mean, I think the bottom line is that we don't understand everything that we're seeing, and that's probably not surprising to... Okay, now I'll do it. And they're gonna lose I mean, I think sound. the bottom line is that we don't understand everything that we're seeing, and that's probably not surprising to anybody in many respects. They locked their radar onto it. They followed it. And then all of a sudden it would move. And uh, it had no exhaust. It had no plume. Uh, it had no visible wings or any kind of engines. So we don't know what it is, but it's something. That's why I'm announcing that NASA has appointed a NASA director of UAP research. Who is a shell from the DOD? Oh, it's Kirsten Gillibrand. Let's see if she talks about Iran here. They can do not uh, identify and records there's, of oh God. objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they move, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. This topic Andre Carson. Is, is something that has been placed in the science fiction category. Um, however, the occurrence of UAPs near our military bases has been documented and poses a national security threat, especially since so much about them is, is virtually unknown. What I have to say, the House of Representatives, I'm going to drop the F-bomb on this one. Why in the fuck aren't the Republicans working with Andre Carson on the other side of the aisle bringing him in? He actually got to run a UFO hearing, unlike uh, um, Tim Burchett and Anna Polina Luna. They couldn't. They were. They had the ability to chair that meeting pulled away days ahead of time. So let's go back and listen to Andre. I just need to say, if this is truly 
a bipartisan issue. Why aren't we hearing more from Andre? Okay, I think that was really interesting to listen to these statements. Uh, another development in the U.S. has been that in 2022, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office has been starting, which was explicitly established on the request of the U.S. Senate. It's a department inside the Pentagon that collects and analyzes UAP observations from U.S. governmental professionals and regularly reports on the results. Now, there's a lot to say about these reports. I will not do that here. Um, I believe that Speaker Ryan Graves will give some more insight in his own experiences as a pilot, but also talk about how the interest in the topic in the U.S. has been growing and what are the recent U.S. policy developments. The next question is, can we conclude that UAP poses a potential risk for flight safety? If a commercial pilot with passengers encountering a UAP, this could lead to confusion, distraction, and potentially even a risk of accidents. I'm going to open my big mouth here and talk on this one. It's a training issue. Sorry to yell. It's a effing, a feckin', Mrs. Brown, a feckin' training issue. That's the problem. If we don't train our pilots on what they're supposed to see in the sky and how they're going to deal with it, and they, they can't talk about it, how are they supposed to know to react to it? That's the problem. It's, yes, there are problems with things going in our sky, but if we don't let our pilots talk about it with other pilots, if we don't document this information for other pilots to share it creates a safety issue because there's no training or communication on it. I couldn't give a feck if that information goes up to the White House or if it goes up to members of Congress. That information needs to be shared amongst the pilots so they can all, they can all share it and be safe. With 32,000 flights per day in the EU airspace, we feel it's necessary to address the topic. By understanding and addressing the UAP topic, we can enhance the safety and security of our skies. And Christian van Heist will give some of his uh, experiences and also experiences from other pilots. Another key aspect is the security concern. In this era of heightened political, geopolitical tensions and rapid technological developments, the presence of unidentified objects in our airspace raises questions about surveillance, defense capabilities, and potential threats. We feel it's imperative that these issues are explored and addressed. It's also interesting to note that China has issued the shoot down order of UAP in at least one and possibly several provinces. They're using AI to research UAP data and they consider UAP to be a national threat and a flight safety issue. There you go. There you go. The Chinese have deployed AI systems to go ahead and track and understand what's going on. Granted, we've got the new Gremlin devices to go ahead and track and start and get some information. Clearly, clearly, I hate to say it, sounds like China is leading the charge to figure out what these UAP are. We also know that the Russian government is aware of UAP and doing research on this topic. I mean, I think the bottom line is that we don't understand. Yeah, sorry for that. So the next question is, what are the specific characteristics of this 3% of UAP, which is not explainable? What makes it unique? Experts use the term, the five observables, positive lift. That means they have the ability to fly without apparent means of propulsion or lift. Instantaneous acceleration, they can reach very high rates of speed in a very short amount of time. Hypersonic velocity, they're able to travel faster, very much faster than the speed of sound with no uh, sonic boom or other physical effects. Transmedium travel, they seem to be able to seamlessly move through space, air and water. And low observability, they're able to conceal themselves from visual and sensor observation. So this means that they... Which that video I keep on bringing up about the stuff we have from Malta as positive lift, instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity without signatures and low observability because it's going so fast, you can't see it with your eyes. Four of the five. Represent a significant challenge to our current scientific knowledge and understanding. It's good to see that increasingly scientists are coming forward who consider UAP to be real objects that need serious investigation. By studying UAP, there is the opportunity to push the boundaries of our understanding of physics, technology, and perhaps even the nature of our universe. 
Beatrice Villarreal will, will, of course, say more about the research uh, needs and also what is currently being done. The last thing I'd like to talk about is the importance of taking the UP witnesses seriously. For more than 80 years, professionals from aviation, armed forces, law enforcement, but also citizens who reported UAPs sightings have faced skepticism, ridicule, or even professional repercussions. In this respect, I'd like to mention an example, which is quite famous in the Netherlands. It's the Susterberg case, which happened in 1979. Twelve Dutch military personnel saw an actually independently partly a triangular-shaped object around 45 meters in diameter slowly fly over their airbase, which, by the way, was a joint airbase with the U.S., and to this day, the witnesses feel that they were... Oh, by the way, by the way, the UAP were there observing, which the presenter isn't bringing out, is because there were nuclear weapons stored at that base in the Netherlands. And we all know UAP show up wherever there's nuclear material. So... A little piece of information that's being left on the floor that everyone should understand. I do like the cartoon picture. That's a good one. Not taken seriously. This is from a documentary uh, recently released by Bram Rosa and uh, showing in many cinemas in the Netherlands. They said it was just a reflection in the air, and it was this and it was that. That's not possible. If so many people are standing around, they should have taken you 100% seriously. Yes, they should have. If people have so been noticed, and not being able to talk about encounters, or even I've actually increased the playback speed. If it bothers you a little too much, I just have it increased by like 25%, so we can try and get through this. Ridiculed can certainly have a negative effect on the health of professionals. The importance of sharing experience and emotions after such events is crucial for the well-being of these professionals. And therefore, and we feel this is also uh, true for UAP experiences. So therefore, we feel psychosocial support and creating an environment where professionals can freely share and process their experience and emotions is really important. And in that respect, uh, and it was already said by Francisco, we feel it's crucial that policymakers um, do create an environment and the required legislative frameworks to allow witnesses to feel comfortable coming forward with their experiences and knowing that they will be heard, respected, and supported. We do hope that this historic event in the European Parliament will contribute to ending the stigma. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what could be next. Firstly, we feel it's important to raise awareness and educate policymakers, professionals, scientists, the media, and the public about the reality and the significance of UAP. Secondly, we need to prioritize data collection on UAP through advanced monitoring, and we should enhance multidisciplinary research. By leveraging expertise, technological research resources, and international collaboration, we, gain, we can gain a deeper understanding of these phenomena. Thirdly, we need to establish clear protocols and procedures for reporting. This includes channels for pilots, military personnel, other trained observers to report sightings. And lastly, we should include UAP explicitly in relevant EU legislation, for example, on aviation safety and in the space law. Pauses for a second. Yes, Matt. Finally. So if they're uh, a joint military exercise or a joint military um, thing that they're doing that involves the United States, are they required to involve the United States with any hearings or anything like that that involve it? Or nope. are they free to talk about it and do what they need to do? They can do whatever they want. It's the EU. It's their part of the EU. Now, remember, the EU is a coalition of different countries who have come together to form the EU, right? Each, or each country that's part in part of the EU is actually, well, has its own military, has its own reporting structure, has its own national security. So while France and Italy have been going and researching this, and Fran uh, the, the uh, minister of the military in France recently came out and said, I can't talk about it, it's an issue of national security, and pushed off the press. So what we're talking about is getting all that information to start coming forward and to be shared with people that it should be shared with, if that makes sense. I mean, they want to share it amongst all the member states and not just keep it on the individual member states. It should be the data is shared and brought together on the coalition. Uh, Neil, you have your hand up, my friend? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like um, 
the EU is like, well, we're not waiting around for America or in the United States to uh, make, you know, say anything or make any yeah. announcements. We're going to look into this ourselves. Like we're like we're independent of them anyway. So here's what we're doing for our people. Uh, and I, I think it's it's absolutely uh, fabulous. And I hope they get somewhere with it, you know, yeah. that 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 they at least you know, come together and, and, and can, can, you know, share what we do know, you know, great points, my awesome. friend, I, you know, information sharing on a global perspective is something that's necessary because even as the space force came out a little more than a year ago, and they said, this is a global issue. It's not just affecting the United States. It's affecting everyone worldwide. And if we are work, if they are working with their partner states or their partners around the world, that would probably include all the countries in the EU. Here we go. Our last slide. We feel all stakeholders within the EU have a responsibility to address this topic with seriousness, integrity, and scientific rigor. By doing so, we can all ensure the safety, security, and the well-being of our citizens. I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward for the discussion on the topic. Here we go. If you want to applaud, you can applaud. If you feel safe to applaud, it's okay. <laughs> Don't, feel, don't be tense. You're free to do whatever you want, so don't worry. So now we'll, uh, we'll pass the word to Eduardo Russo. Historical EU context. Here you go, guys. This is in our friends across the pond. This is in your neck of the woods. Yeah, open the mic. Okay, now it's work. Well, the historical European context. UAPs are not just an American phenomenon, as some may think or believe. It's always been a global phenomenon with sightings and testimonies from all over the world. Europe has always been in a central position as of sighting reports, even before the American public discovered the flying saucers in the summer of 1947. The first post-war wave of unidentified aerial sightings were the ghost rockets over Scandinavia, but also Italy, Greece, and the Mediterranean countries in 1946. And there are a lot of European witnesses. You may ask, how many? We are talking of opinion polls that ask the question, not so many asking the question, who did you see a UFO? And we have some seemingly different percentages that amount to an average, a weighted average of 6.5% people having seen UFOs. If we remain to the European Union countries, that means as much as 29 million people having seen, thinking they have seen a UAP, a UFO, call it as you like. Not all witnesses are reporting their own sightings. Our estimates are that less than 1% of the witnesses are stepping forward and are reporting their sightings. Since the databases of case histories collected by the civilian UAP organizations are presently comprising about 170,000 reports. Is it much? Is it few? It's higher than the total number of USA reports as collected by our sister organizations in the United States of America. We are talking of Europe in a geographical sense, from Portugal to Ukraine, from Norway to Malta. Unidentified aerial phenomena are not regular in their apparitions. Sighting reports are coming in waves with rich or poor years. The first large wave of sightings was in the spring of 1950, and it was a really European one, hitting several countries, Belgium, Italy, Spain, the UK. An even greater UAP panic took place in the autumn of 1954, with thousands of cases, mostly in France, and so on and so on. We had the national waves in the UK in 1967, in Spain, 68, in Italy, 73, in France, 74, important waves of UAP sightings took place in most 
European countries along the last 75 years at last. My own country, Italy, suffered such a strong UAP wave in the late 1978 that fishermen refused to go out fishing. Police patrols were sent photographing str strange lights in the sky. Parliamentary questions were asked and the government charged the Italian Air Force to begin a formal collection of testimonies from the public. You can see here one of the national examples with the peaks and the sightings in, in certain years and not in others. Even if 90, 95, even 98 percent of those UAP phenomena are later identified and explained with known... Sorry about that, Matt. You had your hand up, my friend. Uh, yeah, I just was wondering um, the reporting for civil is it for uh, civilians. Um, how do they go about it differently in the uh, UK than they or the Euro than they do here? I don't know that. I know they're talking. They're talking about sightings coming from UAP check. I'm not sure what that is. It's a, basically it's equivalent to our version of MUFON. Okay, that's all I was wondering. Okay, cool. Here we go. Phenomena or man-made objects, which is precisely the grassroots activity of us UAP investigators, we are left with a small, yet not negligible, residue of anomalous cases totaling thousands of UAPs in the strict sense, unidentified, in a European scale. What are people seeing? The largest part of sightings are either distant lights in the sky, you see more than 75% of reports, or of distant daylight flying objects. But we also have got higher strangeness and higher credibility reports as close encounters when the phenomenon is not more far than 150 meters from the observer. And it is about 10% uh, of this is just a national sample, my national sample from Italy. It's about 28,000 reports. The special cases I'm referring to may be sightings from the military, may be physical effects, temporary physical effects on the surrounding environment. Pilot reports that we've been talking about that Andre mentioned before. Ground traces, radar detection cases, and just think that we cannot get all radar detection cases since a large part of it, of them, are military case histories, and we are not given unless there is some declassification of data. And more recently, the attention moved to the sea, to the water, and you see we have about 1% this less more than one percent of USOs underwater objects. You, you can choose a name for them, and there are social side effects uh, which have been the, the object of academic studies by psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists. Even if I can't talk here now some real panic situations, we are left with a great number of people wondering what they saw. Millions of people who have a right to an answer, if there is one, but cannot find anybody officially charged to give one to them and are crushed between those telling them you were drunk and those believing it's just extraterrestrial visitors. It's only the private organizations, the volunteers that take charge of these people, of their testimonies, trying to find and offer those answers to witnesses. They are, we are, unpaid volunteers that are doing this by passion. There are a few hundreds of serious-minded private researchers who try to apply a scientific approach within the European Union. And there are dozens of rational associations of them, one in nearly every European country. Some of them having been active for decades just think that the British National Association has been founded in 1964. The Catalonian Spanish organization since 1958. And the Danish one, 
1957. What are they doing? They are collecting testimonies. They are doing field investigation, trying to find a solution. They can find an explanation for the large, largest, very largest part of the testimonies. They are, we are collecting documentation, archiving, and offering support for study and research that is not our business. It's not the private volunteers that have to do to make scientific studies to the scientists. And we are doing an activity of public education, conferences, congresses, interviews. Just think that the largest existing archive about UFOs in the world is in Sweden, the archives for the unexplained. The military. The military have traditionally been collecting UFO, UAP reports within their proper mission of controlling and defending each nation airspace. Most, if not all, European countries have had its own military archives of mostly military reports, just like in the USA. We all know about Project Blue Book, but something similar have been existing all over the world, nearly all over the world, and in nearly all European countries. But what I want to tell and to stress is that as many as 10 European countries have declassified their military UAP archives or opened their UAP files in part or in total, which is amounting now to several thousands of reports available for study. And what about the other countries? Well, we have another 10, 12 countries that have done the same. But let's remain to Europe now. As for non-military, yet government organizations, I'm not talking about private volunteers, collecting and analyzing UAP reports, can I say that the only one, not just in Europe, but in the world, is in France, in 1970, 1977, the National Space Study Center, CNES, the European NASA, if you want, created a study group on unidentified airspace phenomena. They called them phenomena, they called airspace, not just aerial. The Japan now changed the name twice, it's Japan. It's not only still active, as Andrea showed, but still offering investigations and precisely that service to the French public only, collecting their testimonies trying to identify the causes, offering those answers to the public. We will get back to them. What about the politicians? Well, they have been involved since the beginning. Parliamentary questions were asked in most European countries since at least 1950. And the European Parliament got its own share of them too. You may see. Questions in Parliament about UAP, wrong one. Come on, what the hell did I do here, wrong window. Uh, about UAP, let me bring this back in. Um, it's gonna get good. Wait for my friends in the United Kingdom. That there is a collection bias here because I got too many Italian ones, but uh, we are sure that France had quite a collection that has not been collected uh, properly. Uh, and around Europe, can I say that Europe is, in, was, is including the United Kingdom? Look at how many. You know the British Parliament is a special kind of Parliament. 110 parliamentary questions since 1950. Not bad. And the Euro Parliament, nine. Nine. Even if we take away the two ones by Francisco Guerrero that uh, elevated the total, it's <laughs> seven times more. But not just questions. We have a precedent. When in the last part, in the last few months of 1989, Belgium, the country we are now sitting, suffered a heavy wave of sightings, several thousands in, of, let's say, one month, one month and a half, taking the local UAP study group, the SOBEPS, the Société Belge de Tudes de Phénomènes Spatiaux, to have a collection in two volumes, of, two volumes of several hundred pages. Well, it was a European, no, not yet. He was a, uh, it was a, a, a Belgian, uh, Euro, mem member of the European Parliament, I should say for chauvinism of Italian origin, Elio Di Rupo, later becoming uh, uh, the first minister of Belgium, years later, that asked a question and uh, obtained that uh, the Committee of Energy, Research and Technology of the European Parliament began an investigation. Uh, the committee charged an Italian scientist that was a member of the Parliament at the time to do that work, and he offered uh, a proposal of resolution, not creating a new office, but giving the French Japan, we talked about, a European status. 
Then the action went another way, the legislature finished, and uh, it remained uh, like that. So the ball is once again here. What are we doing about it? What are you doing about it? We don't know. This is a very short and quick uh, panorama about European history of UAP and UAP studies. Not okay, bad. thank you for the presentation. So far. Just signals the importance of us having a uniform system and an harmonized system here in the European Union to collect this data and to then be dealt by professionals uh, on the matter. So I'll then speak, uh, pass the word to Mrs. Beatriz Villajuel. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. I hope so. <laughs> Perfect. Now, Beatrice is from Sweden, and she's also she's the person who was talking about the UFOs that were uh, or the uh, celestial objects or satellites around our around our uh, country back in the '40s and '50s, well before that we actually had satellites up there. And uh, this should be an interesting conversation. Here we go. Beatrice, why not pause? They're just a little slow. Give them time. Again, no complaints from my side. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So I will tell you about uh, science and your UAPs. So in 1952, on 19th of July, uh, on an airport, in Washington National Airport, uh, the air traffic controllers, when they were looking at the radars, they saw multiple weird objects that shouldn't be there. And this was seen on several radars. And later, also witnesses like stewardesses, pilots, saw things in the air at the same time. And uh, during these weeks, especially during these two consecutive weekends, there were multiple objects seen, multiple radars, that were moving with had had weird movements, really big big speeds, and many witnesses saw this. There were something like 500 sightings uh, in U U.S. of UFOs reported that month, like 35 times more than on average. And what happened in this time period, uh, where they even had like fighter jets hunting for these mysterious objects that nobody knew what it was? Uh, what happened then was that even President Truman had to acknowledge that something was seen. So the U.S. Air Force on the 29th of July, 1952, they held the largest press conference in the United States after the end of the Second World War to discuss this kind of uh, Washington flap, as sometimes is, is referred to. And what they did was saying, well, the radar observations were some kind of weather disturbances and whatever the people saw in the sky at that time, that must have been some kind of misidentification. And uh, that's where we're, where we're going to start this conversation. Welcome to my talk. I'm an astronomer. I'm also a uh, L'Oreal UNESCO um, International Rising Thailand's uh, prize winner in 2022. And my research topic of one of my research topics uh, is searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that is what brings me here. So we have already heard the very good uh, cases for that people see things that shouldn't be there in the air. And we, there are multiple really good historical cases where you have, uh, where things have been measured with multiple instruments like was lifted by the RO uh, or Pentagon report in 2021. And uh, now the question is, of course, what does science say about this? The picture is not as bright in science because there's a huge stigma that has been preventing scientists from researching the topic over the last 70 years. It's a really, really serious stigma. It's difficult to publish. And because it's difficult to publish, then you can, if you get some evidence and you cannot get it published, then again, it's said that there is no evidence, so therefore you cannot publish it. You get the catch-22. So right now, the scientific evidence is missing for the phenomenon. It is not established as a phenomenon, according to uh, physical scientists. And uh, uh, what I wanted to say was um, this can all change, of course, because we need measurements. We need data. There is a, a big mismatch between what has been reported and collected and what has been documented and what the uh, governments know. It, it, ma many things have been classified. 
while uh, in um, in civil science we simply haven't been having the chance to really look into this phenomenon. However, something that uh, is not as stigmatized is searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is actually there are many astronomers working within this topic. So far, nothing has been found. But uh, within, if you just look at the ET hypothesis for the UAP, we know that there are billions of uh, planets that look like the Earth and that are in the habitable zone. And we also know that we humans are capable of uh, creating a probe like Voyager and Pioneer and send it to another star already now. It just will take a very long time. And we also know that biomolecules have been found on uh, meteorites. So there's a very good case for that there's lots of life out there and many, may, maybe even many advanced civilizations. So NASA last year, they, they made a report. They had a panel of 16 people and they had a look at the UAP evidence and they found actually a number of mysterious metallic orbs in images and they started uh, a UAP directorship. So there is now a UAP director uh, at NASA, which means this is a topic we should really take seriously. And there are different methods for start studying UAPs. The first thing, of course, is that uh, one effort I really admire is by the Sigma 2, led by Luc Denis, where they are looking at cases where they have multiple measurements and have witnesses. And then they go actually do very beautiful modelings and simulations, trying to test different hypotheses, because hypothesis-driven science is very important, not only looking for the thing that remains, but uh, testing different hypotheses. And, they do really excellent work and with testing famous cases and or well-documented cases. Uh, another very, very famous effort now is the one of the Galileo project, where they are, are building a system to detect everything that moves on the sky with, the, say, with radars, observations with optical telescopes, with infrared uh, cameras. And here is a picture of an infrared camera ray. And then they will use machine learning to, class, to say what the different object is so that you can separate a fighter jet from a three-winged duck or anything else that moves through the sky or an UAP. So this is a really beautiful effort led by Abby Loeb and Harvard. So a third way, which I, I'm more inclined into, is actually testing the actual hypothesis of that we are dealing with non-human objects um, from an advanced civilization far away, let's say they send a probe to our solar system. And probes, uh, anything artificial is going to reflect sunlight as if it's very flat. I mean, I mean, it's always reflects sunlight, but um, if it's very flat, you can get short uh, flashes. And these short flashes, you can uh, actually see from the Earth, even if the object is small. And we see them there, like, we can see satellites every day, and in the same way, we can see these alien objects. And uh, the way to do that, uh, to actually separate human objects from alien or ET objects, is by, for example, using images from before Sputnik 1, the first human satellites. So what could you expect to see? Well, you could expect to see multiple such flashes. You could see, see either a single, or you can see several along a line, or you can just and see multiple. And have, has anyone ever seen something? Well, in 2021, we found a very weird example where you could see nine stars or flashes appearing and vanishing within a short time period. And um, so um, here, we didn't know if it was real or not. We tried to, we could exclude every conventional astronomical explanation. Uh, we tried- Hold on, hold on, hold on, chat. You need to have a little bit of respect for Beatrice, who's, uh, we're listening to her talk right now. No, she is not the Avi Loeb of Europe. She's from Sweden. I was at the start of her presentation. She's actually looking at factual information right now of different satellites that were in the sky that were photographed that aren't there shortly after them actually grabbing you. So what we're dealing with is actually slides showing factual evidence of, hey, we've got pictures of them here. And we've got pictures of them when they're not there. It's not like she's taking the work of other people, like Avi does, and bringing that forward and sharing it with everybody. She's an actual, real, 
physicist, not a theoretical physicist. She's a physicist. So if you want to listen to someone and respect what they're saying, Beatrice deserves your attention. And yes, I'm sorry. We're listening to a, uh, a presentation in front of EU Parliament. Not one country in the EU has English as their official language. Granted, right now, she's speaking wonderful English. You're, oh my gosh, it's broken English. People are saying, no, this is not broken English. Trust me. I've dealt with more than enough broken English coming from Asia in the past. They actually speak pretty damn well. So I just want to go ahead and bring this up. She deserves your respect. And I see, Andy, you have your hand up on this one as well, my friend. Well, let me see if I can find uh, out. Yeah, where... yeah, um, definitely. Um, yeah, Bro broken English. No, her, her English is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah it um, is. Mo most, it, I will say it tends to be the Southern European uh, countries that tend to their English is not as good yeah uh mo most of the northern you know sven comes in here who's in whose english is is you know most northern european yeah. countries are taught english at school you so want to you want to go hear broken york. english go hang out in new york <laughs> listen to me yeah <laughs> hark at my broken english anyway why, why i actually put my my hand up um she's talking about where they're seeing you know the, the flashes of light in the sky um I have these on regular occasions. You, you it catches a, a, a you know, um, you, you're walking out and, and it something that flashes. I, I I liken it to like a camera flash going up in the sky. It's not illuminating the whole sky, but it's almost like a star on and off. It's literally it's just quick enough for your eye to catch it. And it's, oh, and then it goes. And that seems to be exactly what she's talking about in this uh, this clip. Uh, I, I don't know whether anybody else has ever experienced these. I've, I've seen them easily a dozen times, and that intrigues me. It, it may be prosaic for for me, but um, it's it's not like a uh, you know where you see a, a satellite travel across the sky, or it's it's just a a blink of a light in the sky, and that's it, and it's gone. It doesn't reoccur. Just yeah, uh, yeah. I find it interesting. She's brought this up. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me go ahead and continue on this. Thanks for your comments on that. Yes. And these are actual, not just things that people have seen. These are actually recorded plates showing actual observations of things that were going on in the sky. It's not theoretical. This is reality that she's covering. Let me continue on with this. A lot of instrumental explanations. We were wondering, could this be some kind of plate defect, some kind of nuclear fallout that got stuck on it? And this became a mystery for us, because if real, if a real observation, then it was best fit by, um, well, what we discussed before, maybe UAPs or maybe some new physics, we don't know. Here's another example where you see much clearer, much clearer such flashes. There are three bright stars that appear and vanish within 50 minutes in an image from the 19th of July, 1952. And this was published in the monthly notices of Royal Astronomical Society, which is uh, one of the most respected astronomical journals. Uh, and it was posed as a mystery. When it comes to things that are aligned, here you see another example of several along a line from the 27th of July, 1952. Uh, and the probability to get such kind of flashes or just any objects uh, in a line is one in 10,000. You can estimated this has not been published because it's faced a huge stigma during the review, review process. However, those who took note of my introduction might also recognize that there's something funny about the dates I presented, and that's that they happened right during the Washington flap, which we don't know if this is a coincidence or not. And these are our both most beautiful examples, and they were found before I ever heard about the Washington flap. So how can we actually test this? Well, we have designed a separate experiment where we have, uh, we're going to have a network of telescopes, of wide field telescopes with high speed cameras that are looking specifically for these kind of fast flashes. And the goal is to detect something, to verify it in multiple telescopes. But once you have multiple telescopes, you can also localize it. And if you localize it very well, you might be able to bring down the object to the earth. And uh, as I said, we will try to localize the object 
to the use of multiple telescopes. And by setting, by controlling the distance between each telescope, you can actually also focus your searches far outside our atmosphere, because I'm not interested to deal with any human objects. I want to be far away from any, any satellites or anything of national security interest. And the Exopro project is going to be uh, specifically designed to avoid anything human. We also have a special method to remove all these millions of pieces of uh, space debris that is currently contaminating our skies. So we have developed a method, method for that, and we, we then can get rid of all satellites and all space debris, and we can really focus on flashes from uh, extraterrestrial objects. And once you have an object, you can also characterize it through spectrum. You can see what is it actually? Uh, is this flash some kind of uh, reflection, or is it something in, some intrinsic emission? And now you know the place, you, you have characterized the objects, you know when it appears. You can actually send a team there to pick down the object because we humans are capable of bringing down objects to the Earth. Like was, um, the Osiris Rex, for example, uh, brought down a sample of an uh, asteroid in uh, September 2023. It's a very beautiful project. So we have all the technology to do that as well, if we need to. Uh, here was a very nice simulation that unfortunately cannot be shown in PDF. So I will just leave you with the topic of what can European Union do for us scientists to be able to carry out our research work, to search for UAPs and to get the infrastructure we need to carry out our research. And I want to thank you for it very much. And uh, so <laughs> if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now or later. Whoa, 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 look at the next one. European Crash Retrieval Initiative. This is an effort led by UAP Sweden and the OceanX team with the support of the Vasco Project. All right, I'm 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 looking forward to this one. How about you, Andy? Yep, definitely. Go ahead. So all the questions will be uh, made after the, the all the presentations, so we then have the specific time for, for that. Just to, to let you know that uh, you might know this, and it is, is obvious, but Galileo is an EU project uh, that is funded by EU money. So the relevance, uh, it's, it's really, really high. And we have a difference between our approach to space than, for example, the US. So here is more civil base, more connected to civil society and scientists. The US, it's a bit different, uh, as we know. Um, there's also being uh, written the European space law by the European Commission. They are also uh, made uh, a public um, appeal to uh, commentaries, and some uh, some commentaries from institutions uh, were also presented. So let's see how this law uh, is drafted. This directive, uh, there is a pillar of safety uh, also in this law that I think should be also exploited in the next mandate. Exploited in a sense that should be concerning also this topic, uh, and obviously. This, this harmonization, this coordination of, of instruments that we have should be uh, available to the, to the scientific uh, community. So now let's go to the US uh, to see if our next speaker, Ryan Graves, it's online. Oh. So I'll ask the technical services to, to oh, check it out. I hear about please. the European Crash Retrieval Initiative, not Ryan Graves. Okay, they're going to have some issues getting Ryan Graves' audio up and going. Let's see if we can get past this. Uh, they're going to skip because they couldn't get Ryan Graves' audio working, meaning we could hear him on the live stream, but they couldn't hear him in Parliament. Again, AV issues. That's okay. I guess so. Sounds good. So, please. Come on, guys. So we now have Christian Van Eist, a uh, civil aviation pilot. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. <laughs> it's fine, okay. You guys hear me fine? I think the microphone is working. 
Well, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here. My name is Christian van Heist. I'm a Dutch airline pilot with over 20 years of professional flying experience, close to 10,000 flying hours. And besides that, I'm a professional photographer as well. I started my flying career flying turboprops in Africa, military operations in Afghanistan. After a couple of years, I moved to Boeing 737 that I flew all across Europe for about five years. Oh, this is a good one. And for the last um, 13, almost 14 years, I've been flying the Boeing 747 all across, all across the world and in the capacity of captain, commander since the last uh, three years. Uh, I must really say I didn't, never really had a real interest in the UAP or UFO topic. I seen some things in the beginning part of my career that I found peculiar, but I always thought, together with my colleagues, that it must have been something military. Um, it was only after I saw the testimony from Mr. Ryan Graves and also Commander David Fravor um, that I started to realize that the things that I've been seeing in the first couple of years of my flying career were actually um, maybe more special than I initially thought. I must say, also in the last 20 years of flying, I've seen a lot of things from the cockpit. I've seen uh, military operations, meaning I've seen a lot of rockets, missiles. Uh, I've seen a lot of explosions. I've seen um, satellites. I've seen rockets being blown up in the sky, all sorts of uh, celestial fireworks, let's say. Uh, but some of the things still defy an explanation. And it's only, as I said, after I saw the uh, testimonies from Ryan Graves, that I started to dig in further into my own experiences. And basically, I wanted to know what I've seen. I basically wanted to uh, debunk the whole topic within two weeks because I had some vacation time and I just dove into it. And I basically came to the conclusion that the stuff that I've been seeing um, was just basically not explicable right now. And I started to worry more and more about the flight safety aspect of all those sightings because I'm flying uh, sometimes up to 100 hours a month uh, all across the world. And if there are things flying next to my airplane or pretty close to my airplane or close to the flying path of my airplane that are not identifiable, not even by air traffic control, this could pose a serious issue. So I decided to come forward. I'm one of the first, not really the first, but one of the first commercial pilots to come forward with my sightings in a effort to break the stigma and to hope that the flight safety aspect can be discussed openly, even if it means that uh, we find out that it's a new weather phenomena or a new type of bird. I honestly don't really care. I just want to get to the bottom of it and make sure that professionals like me have a way to report these sightings. Now about my own sightings. Uh, as I said, in the last uh, 20 years of flying, I've seen a lot of interesting things. Uh, the most uh, anomalous were actually only taking place in the first few years of my flying career, and they always took place over Europe, which is important to note, because many people think that the UAP or UFO topic is something from Hollywood, it's American, but I can assure you it's definitely not. My first sighting uh, was over Germany at night. Um, it was a bright light that basically fell vertically down with an incredible speed. It disappeared into the clouds below. It illuminated the clouds below our airplane, um, indicating that it was something really outside of the cockpit. It wasn't just a reflection that I've seen. And even my instructor, which was flying next to me, it was one of my first flights as a commercial pilot, was really uh, shocked by what we saw, and I never found an explanation for what it was. Almost uh, four years later, I saw something very similar over the coast of uh, Greece. Uh, it was a clear, clear bright day, no clouds, no, no thunderstorms around. We were flying at around 36,000 feet and suddenly there was just roughly 10 kilometers ahead of us and a little bit to the east of us, a bright light falling vertically down. Uh, the moment we saw it, it's, I think it's, uh, it must have been uh, coming in at an altitude of around 60,000 feet, which is the moment we could actually see it uh, coming into the, uh, the window frame. And it fell down within, let's say, roughly one and a half seconds into the sea, just disappearing into the Adriatic Sea. So, Andy, you know what we're hearing here? On then. 60, 000, seeing it at 60,000 feet, going straight down into the sea in a second, second and a half. You know what that sounds like? That's almost the exact same flight characteristics of what the Tic Tacs were seeing. And here we've got a commercial pilot seeing it over Europe. Yeah, I, I, it makes you wonder how many people who aren't reporting are seeing these things. You know, that, that's transmedium there for a start. You know, there's that, uh, the the the, uh, the speed of the thing as well. You know, um, I'd love to know if it made a splash or not. If it hit, or was it on fire when it went down? Oh, was it going turning into a fireball like Avi Loeb would like to see? Probably not. Yep. Yeah, I'm being a bit sarcastic with that. So, yeah. <laughs> I got you, my friend. Good one. 
good point to go ahead and bring out. Yes, let's go ahead. Anonymous Rex brings up, I wonder if these objects are being tracked anywhere. Remember, Tim, our government has the ability to see everything globally. Globally, from the surface of the ocean out to beyond the moon. Objects that are a grapefruit size or larger, and we can see it all. So if this pilot is talking about what the heck he saw, you damn well better believe that the eye that our spies that have their eyes in the air around the world can clearly see what's going on. And also, I can clearly see what happened here. We got a super chat coming in from Faze Will, coming in from wonderful sunny California for 10 bucks. Thank you very much, Faze Will. I appreciate you that one for that, that wonderful super chat, my friend. Uh, here we go. Let's continue on. This is a great presentation. I know it's taken forever, but you know what? It's worth it. We quickly made a... I don't know if they're wondering why the monitor doesn't work. The DVI cable behind it is not plugged in. <laughs> short calculation on the back of our hands and we calculated that it was moving not even falling but vertically moving with a speed of around thirty thousand kilometers an hour which is uh, hypersonic which is just incredible i immediately asked air traffic control if there was any military activity if there was any rocket launches or maybe something else going on uh the military air traffic controller dismissed it immediately and he left us just without uh, any question without any answers to our question Another sighting which happened uh, over Greece, it happened in the same night that the uh, carrier group with the USS Theodore Roosevelt, the American nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, was uh, passing by just south of our location. And all of a sudden, it was a bright night, uh, it was just a full sky full of stars, no clouds. We saw a very bright light appearing in the, in the sky just ahead of us. It was impossible to judge how high it was, but it was, let's say, among the stars. It was very high. It disappeared and reappeared four times in succession. It, it was moving, not like any satellite or airplane I've seen. And the fourth time it reappeared, it shot out with instantaneous speed and it just dis disappeared along among the stars. I've no other way to explain it, but the speed was just instantaneous and absolutely incredible. Wow. We've never seen anything like this before. Neither my colleague who was sitting wow. next to me saw it as well. Um, as, as I said, uh, that same night, the USS Theodore Roosevelt was passing by. So our default answer was, well, it must be something military, probably connected. Um, but still it was always in the back of my mind because I, I... yes, Andy. Yeah. I've just put, put it in the, uh, the, in the chat as well. Um, 30,000 kilometers an hour is over 18,000 miles an hour. You know, I'm pretty sure the only thing we've got that travels that fast is international space station and um, that's not in our in our atmosphere no it's so not and these are things that, that are traveling in our atmosphere looking. going eighteen thousand miles per hour coming yeah. vertically downwards yeah and either stopping it as we heard stopping it you know 10 feet above the sea no level, these went down into the ocean is in. what he said it didn't even stop it continued and it went down yep now, this is what I call a presentation. Let's continue on here. Here we go. Over here. Good. I, I simply cannot even imagine what type of technology or propulsion could, could generate such an instantaneous speed. And the fourth uh, sighting that I had uh, took a little bit longer than a few seconds. It actually took uh, almost a full hour. I don't know if we can switch to the next picture. It was over a flight over uh, Spain from Amsterdam to Malaga with a Boeing 737. We just passed into Spain over the Pyrenees. It was uh, sunset. The sun had already set below the horizon. And all of a sudden, my colleague is asking me if I could identify the strange type of flying airplane that was or flying object that was ahead of us. As you can see in the picture here, um, it had a really strange shape. And the reason why we were really curious on what, what we were seeing is that we were flying already at an altitude of 41,000 feet, which is significantly higher than most commercial uh, traffic. We were flying this high because we we're pretty much empty. And we also got a direct course to the airport of Malaga because the airspace was pretty much empty. We were the only ones flying there, so we didn't have to follow any airways, highways in the air. And for about 15 minutes, this object, whatever it was, it was hanging ahead of us significantly higher. And it didn't show any signs of a contrail, no tail, no engines, which you normally see 
when we spot other airplanes in the sky. Um, and after about 15 minutes, it didn't move relative to our position. It didn't change altitude. It didn't grow bigger or larger or smaller, indicating that it would move to or from us. So after about, uh, as I said, 15 minutes, I contacted air traffic control, the civilian air traffic controller, asking what type of airplane it was, because we were just wondering what kind of machine this would be. Uh, the air traffic controller was really surprised. He said, no, as far as, far as I know, uh, you guys are the only one over the entire uh, Iberian Peninsula. So he asked us to describe what we, what we saw, um, and he was absolutely clueless. And in, after a couple of minutes, he came back to me. He said, well, military air traffic control wants to know what you guys are seeing, because they're very interested as well. This was, by the way, in 2010. I'm not sure if the date is important, but anyway, it was... Neil? You know, um, the, the thing is, the interesting is that um, these things aren't, they aren't coming in hot. They're coming in cold, you know, it seems. Um, they, they can go 60 miles, uh, 60,000 miles an hour through our atmosphere and be like cold to the touch because they're not using like, our methods of propulsion but it's not just that if you're still traveling through our air going at that speed neil you're going to heat up no matter what goes on so what you're talking about is they have a gravitational field that they're putting around their craft that allows them to not to move in our atmosphere meaning meaning the craft itself is moving through our air that gravitational warp field allows them to move through pass through everything i pass mean through pass everything. through water exactly. pass through air without friction without also without g-force i mean you're yeah. your own contained gravitational yeah. environment you could have a house of yeah. cards erected in your in your yeah. spacecraft and it wouldn't fall down like as yep. you're doing all this yep i want to you bring know? up this little comment here from on the rise all planes should have some type of flare even civilian Here's the thing. We don't know who Ryan Graves is working for. He's pushing for safety, that we should have visualization of these type of things. Now, do we need to have that kind of information out there? Or does someone work for a company that could profit from those types of sensors being deployed on all of our planes. So you just have to understand, someone may be out there saying, this is an issue. We need all this equipment to be on all of our planes. <laughs> Question, are you associated by chance with the companies who could profit from that? Basically, he's a lobbyist and he's pushing safety, but is he pushing the lobbyists pushing safety because they want to sell the equipment, Andy? Yeah, I think even if they did have this kind of equipment fitted to every aircraft, these things are traveling so fast. Most of the time, you wouldn't even pick them up. Bingo. You wouldn't see them. No chance. Yeah, absolutely. Let me continue on with this. Great point, my friend. And thank you for bringing that up, Neil, as well. It was already a while ago. So a uh, military air traffic controller uh, was interested. I told him all the details, and he basically uh, uh, confessed to us that there was no known traffic all the way up to uh, Morocco, for as far as he knew. Yeah. No military uh, activities, no weather balloons, absolutely nothing going on. So we were just left clueless with what we've seen. Um, we saw the object all the way up to uh, our descent into Malaga, which was almost 55 or 60 minutes later. And for a full hour, we just saw this object straight ahead of us. It didn't really pose a threat for as far as I know, at least it was pretty far away. But for the longest time, uh, it's now already uh, 14 years ago, um, I've just been wondering what I've been seeing. And I'm really uh, disappointed that I was never able to report this sighting anywhere. Later on, I found out there are uh, websites like uh, organizations like a UAP Check or MUFON. For me as a professional, I was not really interested in the topic and I was not even aware of those organizations. So I was just left absolutely clueless with my sightings. Since I came forward about uh, two years ago publicly with podcasts and interviews, uh, a lot of my colleagues have come forward uh, privately, both in flight and also after the flights during dinner with their own experiences, which are sometimes um, uh, much more significant than my own experiences. 
Some of my colleagues have reported uh, glowing. Again, this is what I've been talking about. The only way, Andy, that pilots are hearing about this is over casual dinners with other pilots, and they're able to discuss it when all of this information should be collected, should be put in a repository to go ahead and create training materials and training procedures of how pilots should react when they're seeing some of these things, right? I think you're 100% correct. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, it goes down to that snigger you know um reality of, of people talking oh you know and you get laughed at you know how how many of these pilots are seeing things how many of them are not reporting well i i could probably put money on the fact that the vast majority have seen something whereas yeah. on the flip side only a handful probably have actually reported anything they've seen it's it's no let's not talk about this Great points, Andy. Absolutely. Let's continue. Here we go. Or silver objects hovering next to the flight deck, next to the cockpit of their airplane, sometimes flying close to the speed of sound. Some of them have reported groups of pulsating lights overtaking them while flying at a significant altitude and speeds. And also other colleagues have seen uh, different sorts of lights, pulsating lights, etc. It's, uh, it's very varied. It doesn't really fit any uh, certain type of description. Uh, the only common denominator is that we as pilots, we can never report it anywhere. So I think it's very important that there should be a way to get rid of the stigma. So pilots and professionals and military personnel are allowed to talk openly about it without repercussions. And there should be a way for us to report it um, in, in a way that these sightings and maybe even pictures, because a lot of my colleagues even took pictures of the stuff they've seen, uh, should be analyzed in an objective and neutral way, because that's the only way to find out what else is flying in our airspace. So uh, long story short, these are my modest experiences, one of them with an the actual picture. And I just want to get to uh, to the bottom of it. I want to know what else is flying next to my airplanes. Thank you. Let me underline the courage that it takes for several professionals to talk about their experience but also our responsibility of not uh, taking them seriously and do create a system of transparency that professionals of this, this specific area, but others can uh, feel free and safe to report their findings and then having the scientific methodology to analyze this data and understand what, what it is, uh, besides the noise that we all know surrounds this topic. So I think we should focus always on the experience, on the technical parts, on the scientific approach that we should have to this uh, debates, but also the political um, initiative that should also lead here in the European Union, because we are talking about uh, thousands of flights that occur every year in the European Union. And well, this, this phenomenon is, is not just uh, related to civil aviation, but also space. And we also know that some of these occurrences also uh, happen at sea. So let's see if our current... Uh, let's try. Yeah, let's try the Ryan from US. Hello. Hello. Hello, Brian. I'm in Ryan. Can you hear me? We can hear you. The anticipation. <laughs> it looks like they can hear me online. Hello, Ryan. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. We cannot see you. No, no image. Where's is your AV camera on, Ryan? It is. Yes. Yes. So we solve one part of the problem. <laughs> it's better than nothing. <laughs> Let's try to have an image also. Bear with us. Skip past this. Can you hear me? Can you not hear me? Let's see if we can get to the point. Can they actually hear Ryan? Oh, we can see Ryan now. The the voice. We had your image. We had your voice. We had both. But then... Check, check. Sorry for the technical problems. Whoops. Technical problems exist. One, um, two, Ryan, three. sorry. Would you want to try and turn your microphone microphone on and off and also the camera on and off. I won't do anything. 
There's your AV person we get to blame for all the audio issues. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Safety and scientific inquiry. Are... Okay, let me go back. Too often, pilots are afraid to share their stories due to stigma. Let me get a picture of him. Okay, we got that. To understand UAP, we must start by collecting the data. As we convene here, UAP are in global airspace, but they are grossly Sorry, Ryan, we just lost the, the voice. Reported. These sightings are not rare or isolated. They are routine. Military air crews and commercial pilots, trained observers who have lives depend on accurate identification, are frequently witnessing these phenomena, but are either unable or unsure how to report UAP officially. Three, government plays an important role to destigmatize UAP and to investigate the phenomenon. The stigma attached to UAP is real and powerful. It silences commercial pilots who fear professional repercussions and discourages military witnesses from sharing their reports. Governments can help by taking reports seriously and creating mechanisms to collect UAP data and investigate and evaluate it through to solve this mystery. Four, UAP are a global phenomenon and international civilian collaboration is important. There's enormous potential to work collaboratively to better understand UAP. Whether it is through advocacy, international dialogue, or scientific collaboration, the scope of UAP will not be fully understood without global civilian partnerships. <clears throat> I'll take a moment to share my story. Excuse me. In 2014, I was an F-18 pilot in the Navy Fighter Attack Squadron 11, the Red Rippers, and stationed at NAS Oceana in Virginia Beach, Virginia. After upgrades were made to our jet's radar system, we began detecting unknown objects operating in our airspace. At first, we assumed they were radar errors. But soon we began to correlate the radar tracks with multiple onboard sensors, including infrared systems and eventually through visual ID. During a training mission in morning area Whiskey 72, 10 miles off the coast of Virginia Beach, two F-18 Super Hornets were split by a UAP. The object, described as a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere, came within 50 feet of the lead aircraft and was estimated to be 5 to 15 feet in diameter. The mission commander terminated the flight immediately and returned to base. Our squadron submitted a safety report, but there was no official acknowledgement of the incident and no further mechanism to report the sightings. Soon, these encounters became so frequent that aircrew would discuss the risk of UAP as part of their regular pre-flight briefs. The UAP <laughs> we encountered and tracked on multiple sensors behaved in ways that surpassed our understanding, appearing motionless against hurricane force winds, accelerating to over Mach 1, and outlasting our fighter jets. This experience, shared by many other aircrew along the eastern coast, continues nearly a decade later, and the identity, identity of these UAP remain unknown. Recognizing the need for action and answers, I founded Americans for Safe Aerospace. We believe that UAP present an urgent priority for both aerospace safety and scientific inquiry. Our focus is on improving public education of UAP, breaking stigma, and working towards better transparency and disclosure. I'm proud and honored that more than 12,000 people have joined us in our mission at safearospace.org. Anyone can join, and I'm confident this is just the beginning. Last year, I testified before the U.S. Congress. The organization has also become a haven for military and commercial aircrew who have witnessed UAP. One of the biggest challenges these witnesses face is reporting and the absence of safe intake processes. We are actively working with commercial and military witnesses who have come forward to us and shared their accounts. We work with each witness on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the witness's goals, but typically they contact us for help navigating official channels in the U.S. government. In cases with policy implications or where further investigation may be possible, we have helped witnesses share their experiences with members of Congress, professional staff of the Senate Armed Service Committee, investigators at the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which is tasked with investigating UAP, and other agencies. The majority of witnesses who have contacted us are commercial pilots at major airlines. Often they are veterans with decades of flying experience. Pilots are reporting UAP at altitudes that appear to be above them at 40,000 feet, 
potentially in low Earth orbit in the gray zone below the Kármán line, making inexplicable maneuvers like right-hand turns in retrograde orbits or day hooks. Sometimes these reports are reoccurring with numerous recent sightings north of Hawaii in the northern Atlantic. Some of these reports may represent Starlink satellite flaring, but many defy easy explanations. We are working to improve resources to assist pilots with these identifications. In January, I'm proud to share that the Safe Aerospace for Americans Act was introduced in order to give commercial pilots an official, confident, and direct channel to report UAP encounters. If pilots see something, they should be able to say something and learn from it. Other witnesses I work with are military veterans who are sharing UAP encounters with their airspace and oceans. The most compelling involve observations by UAP by multiple witnesses and sensor systems. In these cases, again, most witnesses want their accounts documented and evaluated by the U.S. government, but there is much more work to be done by the U.S. military to support UAP reporting. I believe military and commercial aircrew witnesses who reach out to Americans for Safe Aerospace are just beginning. We're really only scratching the surface and more witnesses will share their experiences once it is safe to do so. We believe that safe reporting is crucial to uncover the truth and better understand UAP. And we are committed to supporting pilots and advocating for their voices to be heard by elected leaders and government officials. Briefly, I wanna share a few of the problems and challenges that we face addressing UAP in the United States. First, at the most fundamental level, the need for improved reporting and data collection cannot be overstated. I believe more than 90% of UAP events go unreported in the United States. Secondly, UAP transparency remains a challenge. UAP represent a national security problem as much as a scientific opportunity. As a result, there is a delicate balance of UAP information that can be made available to the public responsibly. The U.S. military has a vested interest to keep military secrets secret. Even under landmark UAP transparency legislation, the Disclosure Act of 2023 that was passed in the law with several key provisions removed, such as the Civilian Review Board, the president as commander in chief has a right to delay disclosure of UAP records indefinitely for national security reasons. Therefore, there is a unique role and public benefit for nonprofit organizations, academics, scientists to study UAP and make those findings publicly available. I'm happy to report incredible progress has been made on this front. In addition to Americans for Safe Aerospace, the newly founded Seoul Foundation at Stanford, the Galileo Project at Harvard, the American Institute of Aeronautics <laughs> and Astronautics are all examples of private sector efforts that have potential to change our understanding of UAP. The U.S. military is taking this issue seriously because it continues to detect hard to explain events in defended airspace. As recently as this December, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, which hosts the F-22 Raptor and helps defend Washington, D.C., was subject to waves of mysterious UAS overflight with a range of sizes and configurations. General Gregory M. Gillette, the new NORAD commander since February, testified to the Senate Armed Service Committee on March 14th, 2024, and I quote, I've gone into the events at Joint Base Langley Eustis, and I'm using that as the centerpiece of my 90-day assessment to see where NORAD and NORTHCOM can and should do more as this emerging capability outstrips the operational framework that we have to address it, end quote. In addition, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office in the Pentagon announced earlier this month that it is also deploying purpose-built hyperspectral sensors to military bases and training ranges to detect, track, and characterize UAP. Simply put, the American military knows there is a domain awareness gap around small form factor objects and is working to close it. How much will be disclosed about the most anomalous cases remains to be seen. In closing, UAP truly are a global phenomenon. I recognize the skepticism surrounding this subject, but UAP will only be understood if we dedicate ourselves to pursuing and evaluating data. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ryan Graves. You're welcome. Ryan, can you just test your camera, please? Okay, oh, we see you now. Wow. In the end, <laughs> we see you. Okay, so at least we have you for the Q and A. We can see you. We did listen to all of your presentations. Thank you very much. At least I put up a picture for everyone to see, and it worked. 
Um, and I think what you said was really important. So this delicate balance, obviously, about some issues that might be national security, but others that are just uh, being handled by civil society and um, institutions that are not bound by uh, any political or, or institutional uh, framework. So I think we should connect them. And as a politician, I think that should be a, a task for the next mandate because we are ending here in the European Parliament this mandate. Uh, but I think this should be treated as a serious topic as with a scientific base. And so uh, thank you for your uh, courage also to, to, to step up and bring more uh, individuals inside the military sector to talk about their experience, but also to uh, gather these um, uh, instruments so uh, these uh, professionals can clearly uh, present their experiences and also uh, you and several others pushed legislation in the US that helped uh, also these professionals to talk about their experience. So uh, now that we listen to this very interesting and important uh, presentations, let's go to the Q&A. I would start by uh, the public that is here present, then we'll go to, to, to online if there's any questions, but feel free to, to question if you don't feel it is to, to state your name or rank or something, just make a question. Feel free. Uh, if not, I'll do. But feel free. Take your time, please. Yes, hello. I'm Jean-Marc Watkin from COBEPS, Comité Belge d'Études des Phénomènes Spatiaux. I'm in the head of the Investigator Network. I have a question for Mrs. Beatrice Fila Rawls. Yeah. Uh, it's fine to, to look in the deep sky after the lights, but is it possible to look to, to the to the to the Earth with the satellites, because we have uh, a lot of um, cases of UAPs. So to clarify, he's asking a question to Beatrice, that we've got all these great things looking into the sky. Is it possible to use the satellites to be looking down towards the Earth? And I'll remember, David Grush used to be part of the, who's a whistleblower, of course, from the U.S., was part of the National Reconnaissance Office or the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, to be exact. And part of that, they have all the satellites that were looking down, and it was uh, David Grush's responsibility to take all of that data and report it up to the executive branch, Let me specifically on UFOs. Here we go. We can match satellite photographic and a case. Is it possible to get information from this kind of sources? Is it possible to go back in the past? Well, I, I guess we can always go uh, back in the past. I mean, not, I, I think in, not in 1952 directly uh, for my examples, but if we just generally, uh, it depends on the resolution of the satellite imagery and exactly what you want to do, because uh, I think a lot of, of the publicly available satellite imagery is not going to have the resolution that you need in order to look for such, such small objects as our UAPs. And uh, so, of course, um, the, the less publicly available satellites probably do that. And I'm sure that militaries have an ability of seeing a lot of different things. But as, I think for civilian scientists, it might not be the most fruitful approach, I would say. I would prefer to look up. Yes, so just for those who are here in the room, if you want to make a question, do it. You just press here the button, you speak to the to the micro, and then you shut the, the micro up. Um, and yeah, please. Uh, hello, I'm Frederic Delar from the Belgium UFO um, uh, hotline, and uh, we receive every year about uh, 200 observations. Uh, we are very critical, uh, skeptic, you may say, uh, because since the start of our um, hotline, we received 3,700 uh, observations and only 54 we cannot um, explain. So uh, my question was, if there are 
going to be placed uh, in this European initiative for civilian organizations like us, because I think a lot of information that we have that the scientists don't like, get uh, access to. So uh, that was the question. So I guess that was directed to me. Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, there's, there's a political decision. So uh, I introduced this individual motion for resolution that has to go to a specific committee that has to be decided by the service of, of the parliament. And then it is approved or not by the chair of that committee with the, uh, with the consensus of the other groups. This is just the first phase, but I think if you have a political will, then you can adapt that will to uh, a position that is specific in the legislation. And I do feel, uh, even by the experiences that are here uh, brought up, that civil society and several NGOs should also be included in this process uh, so we can absorb the maximum capability of their experience and data and then anal analyze us through probably a, a, a multidisciplinary uh, committee. Uh, but for me, it's obvious that the civil society must be involved like it is involved in so many other issues. And so I think we should also stop the stigma of talking about this because let's, po let's put uh, into the final point, imagine that this, this is nothing. Perfect. At least we all know, we all have the data, we can all arrive to the same conclusion. But if it's not, we also all have the data, we all arrive to that conclusion. And so the path should be this, and I think politically, we should always include civil society, although, as Ryan stated, some issues may be from uh, national security concerns, but I would say that the, those would be just a, a slight minority. But again, civil society should also be included, of course. Yeah, please. Thank you. My name is Lee Dines, and I'm the European Advisor for the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies. Uh, the SEU is a think tank consisting of scientists, engineers, and other pro professionals who dispassionately uh, research UAP. SEU has over 250 members, many from European countries, and approximately 90 of our members have PhD degrees. My question is to Christian. Um, Christian, what steps specifically can be taken with the aviation community to encourage pilots to report UAP sightings without fear of ridicule or professional repercussions? ultimately fostering a safer environment for data collection and analysis? I think, first of all, there should be, first of all, there should be uh, uh, a form or a way, or maybe an app where people, pilots, professional uh, observers can um, submit their sightings, including all the data that they uh, can provide, altitude, location, uh, duration, you name it. And besides there, there should be a central point for um, collecting that data and analyzing it, uh, maybe in reference to other sightings, known sightings, or even uh, space and weather phenomena. And I think the only way to do that is by basically build up a, a centralized uh, database or organization to collect the data. And I think in the EU, it makes sense to centralize this on a European scale. Uh, there are some initiatives locally for different nationalities or sorry, different nations to collect the data, but I think this should be a European uh, database. And I think this European database in time can be maybe compared to US database as well or other bigger organizations. So you don't have all this splintering of all the data being, uh, being gathered. I think that's the best way to go. So let me just... Uh make a question that pop up here on the on the chat online. Uh, these are not directed to, to anyone, but uh, just one is directed to someone. So there are a few, but I will, I will just make the one that is clearly directed to someone. So to Ryan from Gulam Sentinel News, he's asking, are you satisfied with Arrow's latest report and are you happy with the aftermath of that report in the uh, media? Ryan, to you. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, well, generally speaking, no, I'm not satisfied with the historical report that was released by the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office as of late. Now, I won't pretend to be a historian of the UAP topic going back to the 40s or, or earlier. Uh, however, one thing was clear is that the language and the dismissal that was inherent within that report did not align with the 
the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommendations for reporting UAPs that went out to all service branches. Exactly. And right. in that reporting, they were very clear that this was a serious issue that was occurring internationally as well as domestically and was a concern both for aviation safety and for our domain awareness. So uh, I think that the report did focus on a few key uh, areas and they chose what they elected to speak about, but I think that the precedent of caring about this from a defense perspective is ongoing now and more important part of the conversation. So to answer the second part of that question is I would hope that the press would be more engaged in the national security angle of this than the uh the the little green man side of the conversation okay thanks just uh they were popping up a couple of questions i'll just run through them quickly because they are really straightforward does the european union have any plans for implementing uap study and reporting programs no and yes so no it doesn't have yes because i introduced an individual motion resolution that i hope it gains track uh not probably in this mandate but let's see does anyone know uh, if there's any animations made on recent UAP sightings which are available for developing education materials? No. Uh, does the European Union have any plans for uh, communicating this topic more efficiently with the public? Also no. Uh, and so, uh, a question directed to me. Um, do you have someone to replace yourself once you stand down from the parliament? No. I hope so. So we are 720 next mandate, so I, I do hope there's a broad scope of parliamentary parliamentary uh, members also from different groups that talk about this issue. So I don't think this should be focused on one individual uh, political member. And for Ryan, um, what one thing could encourage Europe and the US to talk more about with each other on these uh, issues? Mm -hmm. And I will add up uh, if sh there should be like an international uh, political move inside the UN, for example, to really connect uh, this uh, this political drive also, because here was, it was stated that the tools, the methodology should also be uh, combined or, or else we're just probably talking about the same events and we are not double checking the, the, the events and the facts. So to you, Ryan. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So from the perspective of the UN, I think it has a significant role to play as far as quarterbacking the coordination across Europe to be able to report this from an aviation safety perspective. Not only to quarterback it to bring different players to the table in the context of aviation safety, but what happens with that data, bringing in experts to understand it, and then also looking at conflict lines. I believe the study of UAP and identifying unknown aircraft and objects within our airspace is critical for our national security. So around combat zones, around tension areas, our ability to identify these objects and deconflict from potential uh, conflicts is extremely important. Okay, now here. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm Danny Ammon from the German group GAP. We are a UFO investigation group in Germany, and um, I'm also a medical data scientist. And uh, I want to add on to the conversation that started with Frederick and also Lee and where we landed at some kind of a EU database collecting UAP data. I want to put a name on it. I, I'm, I'm proposing FAIR UAP data. FAIR is a, an acronym from Research Data Management, which says data for research to be done on that needs to be findable, it needs to be accessible, it needs to be interoperable, and it needs to be reusable. So all of these aspects, all over the 70, more than 70 years of UFO or UAP research that has been done, which we've heard about today, uh, we haven't been able to wholly collect data or to, uh, like, realize this FAIR data synonym or acronym that I just talked about. Uh, a lot of people today already talked about data collection and data quality. And this is something we need to achieve. And I think this is something we need resources and funding for because it's the basis for formulating like testable hypotheses on the topic of UAP. Like in the, in the presentation of Beatrice, she formulated a, a very specific hypothesis and uh, she showed a way how to test it. And we can do that if we have the right database, but it's not just uh, uh, as the, the pilots uh, 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 very uh, 
understandably you say it's not just limited to any border of any state or to the EU or to the USA because we need data about all of this and it has to be interchangeable and to usable all at once and this is something that that needs to be worked on would you agree with me <laughs> or any thing to add to that thank you so much so in my in my position yes so it's a simple yes and we all have a name that will help the further yeah. further uh, debate on the topic i don't know if any speaker wants to to join on this topic uh, if the, not, the yeah. only thing I would like to add is I think it's important as well to create an awareness about the topic among uh, professionals that are not really into the topic. As I said, I only uh, stumbled upon the podcasts uh, that I mentioned before, and I started to think about my own sightings. And I think especially among pilots or military personnel, um, many of them are not even aware about this whole topic and conversation. So I think this should be part of, um, let's say, training of professionals and uh, creating general awareness. It's just a little side, side note to, uh, to mention. Mm -hmm. Also to add that I had a conversation with a few institutions uh, that, um, that I, I will not name because it's not really relevant, but I, I do feel there's a gap between the reporting of professionals and then the collection of that data and then the analysis of that data. And so there's there's a big gap between, between both, uh, which should be uh, eased if we had some type of legislation and tools to uh, help professionals to talk about it and then obviously analyze the data. So there. Interesting conversation going on here. Um, according, according to our timer, is this right? I have to pull up my stupid glasses to see here. <laughs> oh, it says we still have an hour. 32 minutes to get through this. I think we're going to have to finish this off with the Q&A uh, later on, but I have to say, wow, what a great conversation. Andy, your thoughts on this? Or Tia, or anyone in the back? Hello? I oh, love that. I think this is like some, some of the best information that we've got in a long, long, long time. They're like way open about it. They're not like so stuck up like our people are. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I'm going to go back and rewatch it again. It's, to, been a, to... it's been a great conversation, to say the least. And it looks like I've been me going ahead and dealing with my cameras and stuff behind the scenes. I've screwed things up a little bit, but that's okay. I'll deal with it later. <laughs> Nobody knew. They're setting a great you, example. The information is so good, Thomas. Yeah. Like, it's really good tonight. Yeah. I love well, it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Tia. It's something we're going to definitely uh, dig into as we go down the road a bit more. Um, Neil, you were just saying a second ago. Oh, yeah, they're setting a great example. Um, I hope they, uh, I hope we, um, take note of this and, and follow the, the, the energy that they're presenting that this is, this is how it's done. This is, this, this, I applaud everything that, uh, that we've witnessed and, and I hope it, um, continues to go forward in a positive direction and that, and that it has a, a, you know, a positive influence on the way we're doing things over here, you know? I hear you, my friend. Well, it's actually not that much longer left in this, but we'll, we'll finish this off on another day. Anyway, I want to go ahead and thank everybody for coming out for this episode of Disclosure tonight. It's been one heck of a show going ahead and watching the European presentation. We'll go ahead and finish this off on another day. Hopefully, hey, I had some fun in the chat. It was amazing to take the uh, battle going on with YOYL fools and throw some love at them. And apparently it works. So sometimes it's not about just uh, wielding the heavy fist, but sometimes it's about communicating, talking, and bringing it together community, no matter how we see on these things. On that note, I want to go ahead and thank the people that have thrown out some super chats today. Um, that includes... Let's see. We had one coming in from Scott Jensen. Thank you very much, Scott. We had another one from JCAT. I missed this one. Love you, Thomas. Mike Disclosure, Rick Doty, and the DT family. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Laura Greeno, thank you for your wonderful super chat. Faze Will, again. Wildcat Mahone, and of course, Shermanator Osborne. More importantly, I want to thank our friends in the audience who have been with us today, who, have, who has been out there in the chat. Let me go ahead and take a look and see the participants are. Let me get up the right music on this one. I like to deal with this in that way. Where is it at? 
All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out more importantly. I want to thank the people who have been hanging out in the chat, enjoying the conversation, watching this great presentation. I want to thank Abby Rexa, Brian Premble, J-Cat. I mean, Cat, J-Cat, of course, Charles Kerr, Eric Roth and the Gurus, uh, Rodney Lease, Fox Moldering, Kelly Bro with those piercing blue eyes, Kababa Plays. Thank you very much for being here. King Bull. Uh, who else do we have to thank? Metal Gaming, Mick, Mick, Mike Disclosure. He's actually back in the chat. He's in, actually in the back. How about, how about that? Well, I want to go ahead and thank uh, Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs on the Rise, Mr. Catfish2100, Resonate Rough Ready, Shelly Montgomery, Shermanator Osborne, Terrence Wills, Thor Panku, Tia Loreno, Tony D, YOYO Fools, who's actually been behaving today. How about that? Also want to thank Wildcat Mahone and our dear friend, Yellow Tommy Tinker, also known as Andy. And turning our attention to our friends in the back. Wait, not that one. Just turn that off. All right, I want to thank our friends in the back today. That includes Neil Carr. Thanks for coming out today, Neil. My pleasure, Thomas. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much, sir. I also want to thank Andy W., also known as Yellow Tommy Tanker. Thanks for coming out today, Andy. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, you caught me going to little boy's room. <laughs> That's okay, my friend. I also want to thank Daryl Zernick for another lead super chat coming in. Thank you very much, Daryl. also want to thank Matt Ramon. Thanks for coming out today, Matt. Thanks for your participation. Michael Suckloff, thanks for being here today, Mike. Very, uh, very good show, Thomas, and thank you. Uh, thank you. It looks like the, the Europeans are are going to speed on ahead the, of the Americans. They're on it, my friend. They are on it, and they are serious about it. I love to see it. Any any pressure we can possibly put towards the U.S. government, I support that completely. Also, want to thank. Let's see who else has been in the back for the show. Nick, thanks for coming out today, Nick. Yes, Thomas. Yes, yeah. Thank you, actually. Yeah, show, Roger show. Thank you, sir. Also, want to turn to Rachel Smith. Thanks for coming out today, Rachel. Thanks, Thomas. Great show. Absolutely. To uh, Tia Loreno. Thanks for coming out, Tia. You know, I'm here every day. You better Wouldn't believe it, my dear lady. You've got a reputation in the chat, so keep it up. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, so and that takes us back to believe it or not. Mike, 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 disclosure. Thanks for stopping back in at the end of the show. Yeah, I sent you a text message to tell you what was going on. But, yeah, my, my uh, pleasure. It was uh, unexpected. Oh, don't worry about it. Uh, you sent it to me at 4.06. Yes, that's what happened. So, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, fire. That's right, my friend. You're right. Yeah, it sounds like you weren't cooking, were you? <laughs> no, not me. But it just still got in trouble. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's your fault. All right, as we usually say at the end of every broadcast of Disclosure tonight, eyes open, no fear, be safe, everyone. But go back to Party City where you Absolutely. belong. We'll catch you on the flip side. Good night, everybody. Love you. I'll come back now. Here, press the button.